I'm pretty sure I have this right when I say I've been wanting to talk to this woman for a decade. She was at the center of the sports scandal of all sports scandals, maybe the biggest we've ever seen at Penn State. She was a very young journalist covering it for a newspaper, the Patriot News, I believe, that wasn't a very well-known newspaper, and she won a Pulitzer Prize because her investigative work was that thorough, and I imagine energetically draining and difficult and turbulent to go through as a journalist of any age, never mind a young age. So I'm excited to have Sarah on with us, and we will talk about this project that Metal Arc is doing with her that we are proud of and I'm sure she's proud of, and links her and the roots of this story in a way that must be emotionally draining for her because she's pouring herself into these stories that have a lot of grief and making sure that people get fairness and compassion and understanding. So thank you, Sarah, for making the time and thank you as well for the work that you've done. But I'd like to go back to the starting point on all of this. How did you initially get involved with the Sandusky story a decade ago? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, I'm thrilled to be here and to be talking about uh, important issues and stories and things that seldom you can talk about in the constraints of traditional media. So it's one of the reasons that I've gravitated toward podcasting and these longer form projects because it's really great to be able to have these kinds of conversations. So I appreciate you having me on the show. Um, 10 years ago, wow, 10 years ago, more than that. 10, 12 years ago, I was uh, a little budding little reporter at a really tiny local newspaper, not the Patriot News actually, it was called the Center Daily Times. Um, it was my first job, full-time job. I actually got it while I was still in college and was um, just absolutely thrilled to be a newspaper reporter. The, you know, the thing that I, that I went to school for, the thing that I, the only reason that, you know, um, I, I didn't, I, it, there was a, there was a point in my college career where I was like, college is literally just like an ends to a means, like I just need, or a means to an end. I want to be a reporter. And as soon as I got that job, that became my whole life. So uh, even though it wasn't imagine, a very, it wasn't a very big job, right? It wasn't a high paying job by any means. It's just what your destination was. I want to be paid something, make a living for doing this thing that I love. I I'm curious before we get there though, why did you love it like that? You know, I can't explain why I loved it. I think sometimes I talk to other young people and I say, if you love it, you know it. And if you don't, if you are asking me to tell you how to love it, then find something else to do because there is, you're right, like absolutely no monetary reward to that kind of a job. I was making, uh, I think, $27,000 a year, which was actually pretty good in my market. There were people who were making a lot less than me. Um, and... Yeah, you know, you are you don't have any money, you're totally broke, but you also don't have time to spend any money. So there's like, there's that, you know, the, the, the reward is in the stories that you're doing and the impact that you're seeing happen because of those stories. But also, you know, there's something about being 19, 20 years old and covering, um, even in a small town, covering big stories for that town and sort of the adrenaline rush that goes with that. And we were all, like the whole newspaper, we were all 1920. There was a handful of us. We all lived in the same house. <laughs> we shared, you know, we would we would jump in the same Jeep together and run to the scene of a whatever, you know, and the scanner would go off and the scanner was on the uh, the mantle of our fireplace. And, lit you know, it was it was sort of a scene out of a movie a little bit. Um, and that was every day and it was it was a blast. It was like a fireman's um, or a fire like a like a firehouse for news stories, you guys. And it was fun, right? Like you you were doing the job of your lives, hungry, didn't even matter that you were working 80 hours a week and you weren't dreaming of any of this stuff, Pulitzer Prizes or any of that. It was just sort of like, uh, oh, my God, I get to make a living at this. I remember thinking, like, maybe one day I will get a job at a paper where, you know, I can I can move to a warmer climate. Like I can, you know, that was kind of like my dream was maybe I can move back to Florida. I'm from Florida and like not endure the winters and work at a paper big enough where I can support myself. And that was kind of the goal. You know, um, there was there were a couple of other people I worked with. I remember they would they would say like, you know, ten thousand more dollars a year and I could live here forever. You know, so we we we, we certainly um, 
we certainly did it because we really enjoyed it. And and all the fun and games part of it aside, you know, you would you would cover something that, that you and I might think today is a relatively small local story. Like let's say a house fire, right? Somebody's house burns down. Um, that's never going to get picked up nationally. But as the people in the town who are covering it, the journalists who are there on the ground, if, you know, if that mechanism for getting the word out doesn't exist, the impact is, is pretty great on the community, right? The, um, because you could see, you could see that if I went out at 2 a.m. to cover that house fire, um, and it was in the next day, uh, the next day's paper, that family might have donations 24 hours earlier or donations that they wouldn't have had if it hadn't been covered in the local newspaper. So a family that just lost everything now has something, right? It's it's not um, necessarily life-changing, but it's, you know, telling stories that are important to the community that you are in. And, and very quickly, you can see the impact that that has. And I, you know, I remember talking to friends of mine who went to New York right after school um, and they were, you know, logging tape and they were working for big television shows that, you know, magazine style shows that everybody has heard of. And while those jobs are important, they, they would, you know, they would say like, listen, we're logging tape. We're sitting here literally like transcribing. Um, it's, it's different than the work that you're able to do at 20 years old in a local market where you can really see the reward of your work and the reward of your journalism because there is an immediate impact that you can witness in your community. And so that was that was certainly, you know, that's better than the paycheck because the, the paycheck is so small, but that's it was something that kept me going. I think if I had been the person who moved to New York and was logging tape, I may not be a journalist today. You know, I might not have gotten through that time period. And where are you in your life when the Sandusky story arrives? So that's, you know, that's pretty much where I was. Um, I was, I was just a, like a nighttime crime reporter. I was doing, you know, the two to 10 shift covering anything that came across that scanner. Um, and I had been doing that probably four years. You might have to fact check me a little, but a couple of years when and loving I first it the whole time, heard. not bored, not bored. This is what you want to do. It's still... A great job. No, no big aspirations beyond maybe I can get to a warmer climate one day with ten thousand more dollars doing this thing that I love. Yeah, I actually I didn't apply for any jobs. Um, I applied maybe for one other job before I went to the Patriot News. So yeah, I was pretty content. I was pretty happy, and um, and you know I was just having a conversation with someone one day, and that person said to me, you know. There's a, there's a story that you might be interested in brewing. Uh, and it was related to Jerry Sandusky and a, a kid who had made an allegation against him while sleeping over at his house. I have to admit, not being a, a, an avid football fan, like, you know, I was a fan. I went to games, but I wasn't, like, memorizing stats or anything like that. I had kind of heard of him, you know. I, like, I knew that he – I knew that name was important, but I had to, like, quickly Google and – Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the guy with the charity. But he's a town. local legend as well, right? This is when he's you talk totally about a legend. when you talk about important stories in local markets, he might have been a regional personality, but this was a trusted man who had the sanctity of the program behind him and a uh, revered name in the community, which is at least in part how he was able to get away with some of this stuff. Absolutely. At the, in that moment, though, you know, like he was he was 10 years um, outside of the football world. He had retired 10 years prior um, from coaching. So he was just, a, you know, to me, he was like, he was just a charity guy. Like he was a charity owner. Um, and that's really how I saw the story for the longest time. I was like, well, that's a big deal if a guy who has a children's charity is accused of abusing children. And the, the framing that we see this story today um, what you just described and, and the uh, how it engulfed Penn State football and Penn State as a whole really was not part of my initial view of that story. It was, okay, this guy with a children's charity, you know, has potentially been abusing kids. We should figure out if that's true. And, you know, it didn't go, it didn't turn into a story for a long time. Um, the nature of what I just described of my job, you know, I was writing 
four, five, six stories a day sometimes, uh, juggling a lot of different news. It was much more immediate. And we just didn't have the resources at the, the tiny newspaper where I worked to really like run it down. Um, so I, when I did apply uh, for a job at a slightly bigger paper at the Patriot News, it was one of the first things, you know, we talked about was like, okay, I've heard, I've heard this thing. Um, can, you know, can I have, can I have a little bit of time to track it down? And they immediately recognized the importance of putting the resources into tracking down what, and at that point it was like, just whether or not this is true, you know, we weren't out to, to write a story that said he did it. It was like, is it true? Is he under investigation or not? Because people were working pretty hard behind the scenes to try to cover that up. And, um, and even the initial conversation that I had, that person, that source, tried to come back to me and say like, never mind, never mind, don't look there, you know, it's not true. Um, so it really took, it took my, the bosses, my bosses at the new paper, at the Patriot News to, to really give me the space to just like door knock and talk to people and, and tr try to run it down. And that's how, that's how that story came to be. What did the cover-ups look like? What were the challenges? How long did all of that take? How long did it take you to get at the truth? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, that's a hard question to answer because it wasn't full time, <laughs> wasn't full time work. Um, you know, it was a from the moment that I that I from the day that I heard the tip to the time we published the story it was probably north of two years. But you know, in that time, there was a lot of a lot of days I wasn't working on this. But what um, were the challenges? How would people try to cover it up? Just I I want to take people to the seeds of how the sports scandal of our lifetime to the point might get extinguished if a reporter doesn't stay after this stuff, if a grand jury indictment doesn't end up coming because these things can be hard to prove. Yeah, I mean, it, it really wasn't just about, it, th this part wasn't just about me writing the story. It was also a lot of roadblocks for the investigators too. You know, there's a lot of factors here. You've got male victims, a lot of them, had a lot of space between their abuse and the investigation beginning a lot of years had passed and so a lot of them had dealt with the you know with the trauma of their abuse in different ways some of them uh had criminal records some of them were addicted to drugs some of them just didn't come you know just didn't didn't have the ability to cope with and deal with what had happened in a way that would manifest for them to talk about it a lot of shame a lot of denial. Investigators had a really, really tough time finding people who were willing to talk about what happened to them. So that delayed the investigation for many, many cycles of the grand jury. Um, so that was a roadblock. Also, you know, Sandusky was methodical with his crimes, and that means that he often committed them in the same place, in the same way, which many pedophiles do. And that created some confusion. You know, oftentimes you would talk to someone who believed that one incident was, or, or many incidents were actually one incident combined. I think that there was a lot of untangling to do when you're going back over decades and trying to figure out what happened and who witnessed what, uh, in what place, and which child was being abused in what incident. So that was part of it. There was a, obviously a lack of cooperation when it came to officials at the charity, when it came to officials at the university, documents that should have been handed over, documents that should have been kept properly in the first place that were not kept properly. Um, you know, and then also, and to some degree, there was a small, it was a small town, small town law enforcement. Um, there was, there were some, you know, I think, mishandling of or, or maybe not not the sort of resource devoted to the investigation that you might expect. Um, you know, there was a police report from 1998 that was fairly easy to find, fairly easy for me to find, yet it somehow took investigators a lot of months to find it. Um, you know, there was there was a lot of things that kind of factored into that big long delay between when victim one 
who got his name victim one because he was the first one to come forward, not because he was the first one to be abused, um, but between when he came forward and when that all came out and Sandusky was finally indicted. When you pull the initial thread, you think that story's going to end up where? At what point do you realize that this is not another one of these things that is two to ten on your police scanner, that this is going to be something that consumes you, the region, uh, and I, I imagine alters your life? Yeah, I was probably one of the last people to figure that out. <laughs> I really was. I remember when uh, Sandusky was arrested and, and it came out that there were going to be charges against officials at Penn State, too, which I did not see coming. Um, another reporter in the newsroom said to me, how long do you think Graham Spanier will last before he has to resign? He was the president of Penn State. And I said, what does that even mean? You know, what do you mean? Maybe, oh, well, I guess maybe, maybe he would retire early. You know, I hadn't crossed my mind at all. Um, you had no idea that the, echo, the echoes of this would be something that would be sports scandal of our lifetime. You think this is, uh, you don't think this is going to be the biggest story of your life. You think no, it's... And in, in looking back, like, why would I, you know? There were plenty of, there were plenty of Penn State related scandals. There were plenty of arrests of people committing similar crimes that did not erupt into, you know, enormous worldwide stories. Um, you know, I, I'm not from Pen Pennsylvania. That might have factored into it a little bit. And I certainly did not grow up in a household that was um, college football obsessed. So I may have miscalculated just my, my, my starting point was to miscalculate the impact of college football and of the Penn State's presence in that world. Um, you know, I just, I didn't see, I, the framing for me, I knew it was a big deal, right? I knew we, we treated the story very carefully. We worked in, in tandem with the attorneys for, um, for advanced media, which owns the Patriot News. I mean, I, I don't mean to completely downplay it, but I didn't see it as a sports story. I never did. I wasn't a sports reporter. I was a crime reporter, and I thought this guy committed a crime or is alleged to ha at the time to have committed a crime. So, you know, the, the consequences of it will play out in the criminal justice system, and that was just what made the most sense to me. Well, take me through, though, the age that you are as you are doing good work, you are doing important work. And now what arrives on your doorstep is the hostility of a culture and a fan base that is zealously trying to protect its institutions and what it believes about Sandusky and Paterno. And now what is coming hot and heavy into your life is the hatred and the emotion behind that. Were you able to enjoy that you were doing good work and important work? Or was it like, oh, my God, I'm in my young 20s here and here comes this thing that I couldn't have possibly imagined and everyone's carrying blow torches. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that it was about enjoying it or not. I was a little surprised at the number of people at the time who were willing to set aside the clearly stated facts of the case out of emotion or emotional devotion, attachment, to what really at the end of the day amounts to a couple of colors and like a stadium in a specific location you know like it was a little surprising to me how much emotionally how much their people emotionally attach themselves to these teams um and i i guess you know i wasn't quite prepared for that mindset that um people who otherwise are productive members of society have great jobs and seemingly rational um, would would so quickly deny um, a set of facts that are outlined before them because they want to be able to go to a bar at the end of the day and say my team is better than your team and that kind of blind loyalty was surprising to me. Your blindness is also funny there because it's just such a simple thing in sports to grab your identity from your sports team and be unreasonable about 
stupid stuff, but your being a sports fan but not understanding it that way is funny to look at that you wouldn't expect any of that because I imagine it, it was unpleasant. I would imagine that what they were doing would be so hostile that it would be calling you names for being the messenger on facts. Yeah, I mean, well, listen, it wasn't the first time I covered a scandal at Penn State in the Penn State athletic world before Sandusky's arrest, actually. The, the Nittany Lion mascot, the kid who was like inside the, the costume, um, got a DUI. And I, I wrote like probably 200 words about it. <laughs> you know, he had kids in the, not kids, but he had other students in the back of the car and whatever. We wrote about it because that's what we do at local newspapers. And I got way more hate mail actually about that than I did about the initial Sandusky story. Um, so, you know, that was sort of my introduction of like that world of Fan, fan craziness. There were a couple of players who had been charged with sexual assault that I had covered prior to that. Um, you know, so I, I did understand that people were very, very loyal to their teams. But I think that with the Sandusky story, what was surprising was, you know, the magnitude of his crimes combined with the um, you know, how how strong of a case that prosecutors laid out um, and that, that's sort of all still sort you know, it, this, this denial still existed after all of that. What keeps you these days with this project that you're doing? Because I do want to go back to some of the stuff that you were going through personally as your story brings you here. I've talked to Mitch Album and some other authors about when this becomes your life cause, next thing you know, what's coming up upon you, strangers in the street wanting to tell you their stories, it, uh, it could be life-altering. It could stick to you. You can't just walk away from somebody who is calling you and saying, my son overdosed. He's the first casualty of the system failing after Jerry Sandusky is jailed, after we think we get justice, by simply hiding the problem in the worst place that you can hide, whatever that is, which is an eternal hell where pedophiles are treated very poorly. God knows what medical help they need. God knows what mental help Jerry Sandusky needs. He is put in a cage. That's not us addressing the problem, nor is it addressing what happened with the story you're now telling in multiple parts for Metal Arc Media because this project means something to you because a mother, a grieving mother called you, correct? Yeah, it wasn't a story that I was looking for. In fact, you know, over the years, I've kind of tried to stay away from sort of the noise around um, some of that denial that we just talked about related to the story. And, and um, you know, when, when Marianne Sinisi called me, she's the mother you're referring to, it was one of those moments where I thought, okay, you know, I can say, sorry, I'm not, I'm not covering this anymore. Or, you know, or I could, could listen to her and, and, and ex sort of accept and see the story for what it was, which I really felt as I was listening to her the very first day was an untold part of the story. A part of the story that even when you talk about the other scandals that have come out since Sandusky, and there's been numerous ones and with equally um, important reporting and, and, and impressive reporting, there hasn't been, you know, the, the Me Too movement, like in, in, it's a whole, a whole movement, right, that has happened since Sandusky has, uh, has gone to jail. But there really hasn't been a, a, f a focus on the kind of um, system failures that she was describing to me on the phone that day and I really felt a, an obligation to explore that and to to listen and to go down that reporting path and to see um, you know exactly what part of of the Sean Sinisi story could maybe illuminate bigger problems moving beyond um, the scandal that put him in that position in the first place we say in our first episode which is out now. This isn't a story about Sandusky. It really isn't. I mean, he's the reason that this particular person um, was, what you know, was in this position that he was in. He's the abuser. Um, but the story isn't about the bad guy. The story is about everything else that happens after the bad guy goes to jail, and how oftentimes victims 
And I think particularly in this case, a male victim like Sean does not have the societal su support to get the help that he needed and therefore turned to self-medication. And once he became an addict, you know, we stopped, we as a society stopped caring about him as much as we might have if he was just a victim. We didn't, we didn't afford him that sort of human, humanity, that sort of human sympathy. And then when his addiction, which it often does, led him down a criminal path and he became a criminal and an addict, forget it. We don't care about those people at all. And that impacts, that impacted his health care, it impacted just how we, we as a society treated him. Like he was, he was less than. And ultimately, I think that led to his death. And ultimately, that's the story I thought we needed to tell. I'm going to simplify this for the audience. It's layered, it's complicated, and she has devoted a lot of hours of considerable award-winning time to this project because she cares about you knowing the details of a grieving mother, how she ends up grieving, grieving and how she ends up being failed by the system to simplify because this is a podcast in many parts a young man was abused perhaps because of our inability to deal with the ramifications of that abuse he becomes an addict and a criminal and because of his abuse the victim ends up overdosing on a mcdonald's floor and we blame at the very end the victim yeah, that's is, that's essentially what happened. We we being society, right? He becomes a guy who decided to be a drug addict, a guy who you know had what was coming to him. You know that's that's sort of like up until hopefully now, when people can hear the full story, that's how I think the, his story has been framed. Is you know just another another addict who uh, you know got caught up in in a dark underworld and you know made a choice that's what you hear all the time made a choice to do drugs and 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 had this coming to him and i think that this the the project the goal has always been to peel back that very oversimplified layer uh or oversimplified look at uh, at addiction and trauma and um and reframe it a little bit and uh or reframe it quite a, quite a bit and see it uh with more nuance and really explore what he was going through, what he went through for, t you know, 10, 15 years before, um, before that overdose. You did a lot of learning, I imagine, on this too, right? All of this, much of this is becoming illuminating for you. You're like, oh, I was deeply embedded in this story. And yet still, I had no idea that this was this complicated and that that a victim could keep being failed so that it's almost the surprise if the mother's not grieving because this is the echoes of abuse. Yeah, I think what actually was the most shocking to me and I think really made me reflect on my own worldview the most was had nothing to do with his abuse right it had more to do with in, in general how we sort of silo these things we think about we, we talk about sexual abuse or trauma we talk about addiction and rehab we never talk about them together and how they they work together i also being somewhat naive and before this project in the world of rehabilitation and addiction to me it was a very linear thing you are addicted to some a substance, whether it be alcohol or drugs or something else. Um, you hit rock bottom, you go to rehab, you get better. That's it, right? Seems simple enough, linear, and that's how you sort of read about it in in mainstream media oftentimes. Um, but it's it's very much not a linear process, and so having that sort of detailed and up up close look at how not just the, the victim or the, the addict struggles, but how the people around them struggle right, right there with them are brought into that world and have to deal with um, all of these system failures along with their, you know, in this case with their son. That was very illuminating to me because it it's a descent like into right. hell, right? It's a descent into hell. You're not only feeling helpless and hopeless. You're trying to take care of someone you love. They're addicted. They are now getting I mean, the, 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 the behavior is addictive. And now you're dealing with a system that's not actually helping you. And, and really not designed to help, you know, and you may have you may encounter people within the system 
who are genuinely there for the right reasons, but there are so many barriers. There's terrible, terrible regulation when you think about it compared to other healthcare. I mean, just awful. Um, the standards are insanely low. You would never, you would never send a patient of any other disease to a facility that's run the way that a rehab facility is run. You would never accept that for yourself or anyone you, you care about. Um, it's just simply, the system is simply not designed to deal with, to deal with the reason that people use. And from talking to a lot of people for this story, I think you'd be hard pressed to find somebody who didn't have a reason for using. I don't think the reason is just, you know, oh, somebody handed it to me one day and it was fun. You know, maybe, maybe you can find one of those people out there and, and, and talk to the, and talk to them. Let me know if you do, you know, because I think that, um, I thought, I think I was really surprised by the fact that it was very difficult to find a rehab center that advertised that they would actually deal with the underlying cause for the addiction versus just, um, to, you know, to well, deal but with Sean chemistry. found it, right? Sean and his family did find uh, one of the things you say is that he gets kicked out after a week, but they did find something that felt like hope, even though they didn't have the means because these things aren't cheap. Then and then everything came apart after that. Right, but I mean, let's talk about how long it took them to find that and what what it took them to find that. Right, so he's now ten years into his addiction. Um, when they find that, or they find the, the ability to send him to a center like that, you know, 10 years of being addicted to heroin, what if he had been, what if he had gone, what if the first rehab he had gone to 10 years prior had that philosophy, had those resources? I think you would have had a different outcome to the story. And I think that the fact that one of the barriers, not the only barrier, but one of the barriers to him getting to that facility that it took 10 years for him to get there was financial is also, you know, a part of the story that that is important to highlight that it took the fact that, you know, Penn State um, has accepted some sort of degree of culpability for facilitating Sandusky's abuse, that they were, you know, willing to, to foot the bill for this. Um, for him to get there because there's no way his family could have ever paid for it. You are objective. You are aspiring to fairness and to facts and you are telling stories. It can't help but have the human biases of emotion in it, no matter how much you try to control it. Where along the path in reporting this did you find yourself most appalled? That's a great question. I mean, there were a lot of moments, actually. <laughs> there were a lot of moments where I was like, are you kidding me? That happens? That exists? That seems crazy, you know? And, and I think in the podcast, you'll hear me occasionally say that in interviews with his mother. Like, what? Are you for real? That, you know, that really happened? Um, is there one in particular? <sighs> That's a great question. I can't, you know, I think that there are so many there are so many times where I felt like I couldn't believe that this is considered health care. Um, and that, that feeling returned, you know, many, many times. But it's not, it seems, Sarah, it's not being treated as an illness of any kind. It's treated as something that the entire fabric of it is, is something to be judged as less than. So, of course, the system would treat a criminal addict as less than, and a victim continues to be more and more of a victim if we can't extend the compassion of this is somebody. I've got to get buy-in on the front end that this is an illness. And uh, there are a whole lot of people listening to this that are like, bullshit, you chose to, you chose to use and ruin your life. Yeah, I mean, and I think I think that 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 was a, a certainly part of a lesson for me as well. You know, um, really, if you haven't been an addict or been touched by addiction, I think it's an easy thing to just set aside as other than like not me. Right. Um, 
and and they think that that sort of empathy and and compassion and understanding is part of what's lacking is the education like the overall societal education of what addiction is. Now, I think some of that's changing. I think that like politically, there has been some effort to look at addiction as a healthcare issue and not necessarily as, um, not to frame it in the criminal world, not to frame it as a choice. Um, but we certainly have made, if we've, we've come a little bit, we, we certainly have a lot of a ways to go. Um, before we really, I think, treat this as the as a disease, as if you got cancer. You'll hear Marianne say that in the podcast several times. Like you would never treat a, a cancer patient that way. Not even a cancer patient, like a lung cancer patient who's been smoking for for thirty years. You know, you would you would still never treat them uh, the way that that Sean often was treated in a facility. And that's a point that her, that his mom, I think, very eloquently makes. And and that framing right there, like that very simplified way of, of looking at the situation was something that I even didn't think about. And I cover stories like this all the time, right? I would have never thought like, yeah, why is, why is that? That an addict is, is, is treated poorly because that, you know, that person physically put the needle into his own arm versus a person who picked up a cigarette and got lung cancer. Why do we treat the outcomes differently? I'll come back to this story in a second, but how old were you, Sarah, when you won the Pulitzer Prize? I was 24. How did your life change? Well, I mean, in the immediate, it, you know, uh, propelled me career-wise to a job I, I would have otherwise not gotten. Um, other than that, <laughs> you know, how did it change? Uh, my, my job my job changed. Um Otherwise, I hate to be anticlimactic and not have a good answer. Uh, but otherwise, you know, I just went back to doing the same thing that I was doing before. <laughs> well, but not not exactly, right? Because, and I understand why, I, that doesn't sound like it's false humility. It seems like you really love your job, really love the fulfillment of getting to the bottom of these stories. And, uh, you know, I don't, you're an activist, whether... You're a reluctant activist or whether you're a willing or a chosen activist, you do understand that the work that you're doing is profoundly important, but it's also activism, teaching people, fact-based teaching of people of, hey, you can reach a place of more compassion and empathy. You're doing, you know the work you're doing is important. Yeah, absolutely. I think that any journalist who tries to say that that's not true is lying to themselves. You know, we, we definitely want to approach stories um, with an open mind and, and, and seeing all sides and, and I think even taking great pains to see sides that are not so obvious. But yeah, at the end of the day, there are some stories that don't have two sides. They don't have multiple sides. They're pretty clear cut, right? You look at the facts and you know that um, there's a person who was, who was right and a person who was wrong. And, um, you know, actually, the Patriot News before Sandusky really taught me that to their credit. Excuse me. To their credit, they they sort of reframed what I learned and I think a lot of people learn in journalism school, which is, you know, you, you go to a meeting, you get one person who says A and one person who says B, and, and those two people are opposite each other, and that's a fair story. But, um, but that's not life, you know, life is not is not so equal uh, or so equal, equally opposed. And I think that, you know, we do, I think some of the best journalism when we can, when we can see the bigger, the bigger picture and in it and tell a more nuanced story about what's actually, um, what's actually happening. I think that's, that's something that political reporting could use more of, you know, this two sides in everything is painful in a way. And so, you know, going back to the podcast that we're talking about today, you're going to hear the um, people who um, who the Sinises have accused of wrongdoing. You're going to hear some of them. You're certainly going to hear statements from a lot of them. They were all given the opportunity to, to speak, but that doesn't necessarily mean that th there's two sides to this story. Um, they have the opportunity to tell their, their perspective, but that doesn't necessarily mean that... Um, you know, 
And, and on the flip side of that, too, there are times when I think, you know, we're very honest about Sean's failures um, as, you know, and his, his own personal failings uh, while framing that in the sense this, you know, while framing that with a with a reminder that he was abused, you know, starting when he was eight, nine, ten years old, and how what that does to a person and how that will affect the course of your life. As someone who cares about journalism the way that you do, as someone who knows how thoroughly vetted uh, the work you're doing needs to be, and how soaked in fact-based and fairness the standard must be. I'd be curious as someone who grew up young with old school journalistic sensibilities, what you make of the news media today and what you make of specifically the orange turd that had no subtlety as the leader of our country who took a hatchet to this thing that you care about and ran on a platform of your fake news and the way that you care about news isn't any kind of real and you're the same as Facebook and you're the enemy? Yeah, that is a very loaded question. No, <laughs> I was just being start? fair, right down the middle. I was, yeah. I was, it, orange turd is right in the middle of fairness on him. I could have done a lot worse. Where do you want me to start? <laughs> I want I want to know what you care about this thing that is a protection of democracy, that does good work in communities, that helps people who need to help. Like you care about this thing in a way that devoted yourself in your college years to a police scanner in a house filled with your friends because you wanted to chase the dream of what this means to you, which is pure and utopian. And I don't know your politics. I just... I know you care about journalism and it's under siege, under threat, doesn't have resources. And in the last five years, a president was elected running on a platform of hating us. I think that it started before him, uh, but I think he certainly capitalized on something that actually will take us full circle back to the police scanner on the, the mantle, which is the, the downward turn in the quality of local news. I think there are a lot of people who voted for Donald Trump who saw long before he did and long before he started to say it that their local journalism was lacking and was not what it had been. And I think there was a failure uh, within the industry to, um, I don't want to say save it, although that's accurate, but to understand why it needed to be saved, why local journalism was important, why it's not okay to just have a couple of big newspapers um, or a couple of big television conglomerates, um, why you, you needed to cover the parade on Saturdays, <laughs> to cover uh, you know, the high school prom king and queen. Um, and those are somewhat frivolous examples, but also why, you know, what city council was doing, what the, the school board was, was voting on, um, the corruption that exists at times in towns like that. Um, I think that all of that leading up to, it's not the only reason, but that set a foundation for his narrative that allowed it to take hold. There were, you know, there were certainly times when all the hatred that he said was mis misdirected, misguided, completely unwarranted. But I think it somewhat resonated with people who felt like... Not somewhat. Not other, somewhat. Pe yeah, people were, people stopped caring about them a long time ago. They they understood, like, they 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 grabbed onto that message and felt like it it spoke to them. But why do why do people hate failure. you? Why do people hate you? This thing that you believe in that they don't understand the way you do and that they don't care about the way you do that they think is liberal and biased and not fact-based as you bend over backward to give the other side even in instances when perhaps you're personally appalled and don't want to but you want to look in the name of fairness, like I, I am genuinely curious how you absorb all of that because you're in a fascinating position as a prize winner who has won the ultimate prize and shrugs her shoulders and says, and I just got back to work the next day because I love this thing. They don't hate me, right? They hate the idea of me. They hate the fact that, that 
the media only shows up when something bad happens in their town. They hate they hate that. You know, of course they do. They hate the fact that when the media shows up, they're often or sometimes never from their hometown. That there's some person, you know, from New York or L.A. <laughs> who is telling or Washington, D.C., who's telling them what they should care about by only covering certain kinds of stories in their town. That's what they hate. You know, they don't hate me. It, it was an interesting evolution. I worked at, seven, at CNN for seven years. In the beginning, we would show up, at, you know, and I was that person, by the way, from New York or D.C. who would show up in a hometown. Um, we would, you know, land at the airport in our 30 bags of gear, would come off the conveyor belts and... They would all have CNN stickers on them, and people would come up to us and say, oh, my God, CNN's here. Thank you for coming. You know, we, we needed the coverage of X, Y, Z. And then toward the end, it was we would land in an airport, and our 30 bags would come off of the, air, the airplane onto the conveyor belt, and we would peel those stickers off, you know, like, like cover them up or, or, or not fly with them at all because we didn't get the same kind of welcome. It was a, It was... Um, there was an evolution. There was a, this idea, that, this sort of resentment that you're only showing up um, for the worst um, and to highlight the worst of the worst. And you know, I I can see I can see how that can become what it has become. Sarah, thank you for being on with us, and thank you for partnering on this project. I'm very proud to be affiliated with this good work that you are doing because you just articulated the importance of what you do and who you are because this story was at least a byproduct of you caring about this thing in a community for the community by the community you your career was made because you care about journalism in a way that made you do the important work that resulted in a sports scandal of all times and you had the most thoroughly reported details because you were the community reporter you were really in that community feeling the pains and the emotions of those people and it showed in your work like you are that story they, they can't hate you because you were at the source I, I, they do anyway right because they toppled <laughs> they statues do. and they may blame you for killing joe paterno right because his life ended right after that because what you take away that person's identity, that region's identity, that football program's identity, I could see where you would get blamed even if you're doing fair reporting on behalf of victims, which seems like the most pure and utopian way to do what it is we do for a living. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes to everything you just said. I think that I think that. Um, they do. They do sometimes hate me. That's okay with me. I think I. I. I am very proud of the work we did ten years ago. I'm proud of the work we're doing ten years later. I am also really happy that I took the time to sort of reevaluate. You know, I had a kid in 2018, and I said, you know what, I want to go back to to doing that important work on it at a, a, a level. Um, that I was doing it before, um, in depth, taking the time, giving it what it deserves. And so I'm really happy to be in that space again. Um, not necessarily, I'm still the, the person that lives in New York, unfortunately. But, you know, I'm still that person that sort of has to, has to swoop in. But at least I think I have the ability now to spend the time understanding um, the full scope of the stories that I'm doing and the nuances that come with them and not just to do them sort of on the fly um, the way that, that I had been for some time. So, What about uh, what about this story spoke to you? I'll let you out on, on this note and urge everyone to catch the podcast series in co-partnership with Metal Lark Media because it is important work and it's good work. But you talk... To a grieving mother and you know how soon afterward okay this this story is calling me I, mean, I knew as soon as she called me that it was a part of the story that we really hadn't considered that we hadn't talked about enough what was what were these victims dealing with what are victims of of all of these movements all of these headlines that we you know eagerly write about and read about what are the victims dealing with after the bad guy goes away I had not, I had not considered 
all of those consequences, and I felt like that was an important story to tell. I will also say, again, because all of this comes together at the end, um, I also saw an opportunity to go back and do it with, with in partnership, not just with Metal, with Meadowlark, but with Penlive, to take it back to the local level, to take it back to the, the newspaper that, that first, you know, devoted the resources to breaking the story. Um, and do, you know, work within a community again. And so, you know, those two things were really important to me. Uh, grateful for the partnership and grateful for the work. And even though it was two years too late, uh, it was worth the wait. Thank you, Sarah, for making the time for us today. And thank you again for the work you do. Thank you. It was great to talk to you.